Thank you for joining us for Sermons on Demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. We provide these videos as a way to share the pulpit messages and teachings offered at Friendship Grace Brethren Church. If you find these videos a helpful resource, please drop us a note at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com. Now open your Bibles and get ready to dig into the Word of God. Do we have any questions about anything tonight before we move on? Just quick, Nancy Dearborn said she that she loves you and she's praying for you and your family. I talked to her this afternoon. Is that directed to Steve? Yes, that was directed to Steve. Okay. okay. Very good. What did you say? I missed it. I talked to I talked to Nancy Dearborn every Wednesday afternoon, and she said to tell you that she loves you and, and that she's praying for you and your family. Thank you. Okay then, let's uh, let's continue on. Then, since we have no questions, let's see what what kind of trouble we can get into tonight. Read Genesis thirty two twenty two through thirty two and thirty five nine through fifteen. What is significant about God changing Jacob's name to Israel? What's significant about that? Now I got the hiccups. The uh, same night. He arose and took his two wives, his two female servants, and his eleven children, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok River. I have been to that location, and it's pretty cool. It's a it's a neat looking little little uh, tributary entering into uh, into the Jordan River, and it's a neat flat area where you could see lots of people camped and so forth. He took them and uh, sent them across the stream and everything else that he had. And Jacob was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, Let me go, for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not lest you go, uh, let you go unless you bless me. And he said to him, What is your name? And he said, Jacob. Then he said, Your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel, for you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked him, Please tell, tell me your name. But he said, Why is it that you ask my name? And there he blessed him. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, saying, For I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. The sun rose up on him, and he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. Uh, therefore to this day the people of Israel do not eat the sinew of the thigh that is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip on the sinew of the thigh. Now on to chapter 35. God appeared to Jacob again when he came from Padamaram and blessed him. And God said to him, Your name is Jacob. No longer shall your name be called Jacob, but Israel shall be your name. So he called his name Israel. And God said to him, I'm God Almighty. Be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations shall come from you, and kings shall come from your own body. The land that I give you, Ab gave to Abraham and to Isaac, I will give to you, and I will give you the land to, uh, to your offspring after you. Then God went up from him in the place where he had spoken with him. And Jacob uh, set up a pillar in the place where he had spoken uh, with him, a pillar of stone. He poured out a drink offering on it and poured it oil on it. So Jacob called the name of the the place where God had spoken with him, Bethel. Okay, so there's the two accounts where we read about Jacob's name being changed. Why is that significant? Because the name um, Israel means to strive with God, and that's what Israel does with God the entire time. They, they strive and argue and fight with God or, or about doing God's will. Okay. Is there more? 
Well, if God promised the, tri the nations to Abraham, why is he naming Jacob Israel? And that's an interesting, interesting question. Yeah. Why well, did he name Abraham Israel? Because Abraham had one son that uh, became the father of those people. And Jacob had 12 that became the fathers of the uh, of the tribes. And so you have this this confederacy of tribes called Israel. So that makes a little bit of sense. But yeah, why isn't it? Uh, why aren't they Abramites? Why aren't they Isaac Isaacites? Except that's really hard to say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but the, they can't be the Jacobites because that's what because that's kind of like the name of the people that were in Jerusalem, like Jebusites, Jacobites. There's lots of ites that sound the same. That's that's a that's a low power argument, but let's let's uh, take a look at this. Names in we know that names in in biblical society had meaning and often were used to describe the person. So I think often what we see are names that are really nicknames. Like in the New Testament, uh, Barnabas. What was his real name? Joseph. Right, yeah. But he was called Barnabas because he was the son of encouragement, and that's what that meant. So those are like nicknames. But Jacob was named Jacob. I suspect that... Isaac had a little bit of forewarning or a little bit of in Holy Spirit encouragement to name him Jacob because it describes who he was. He was a deceiver, right? The 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 name Jacob, uh, the root of the name means heel. Like the backside of your foot, heel. And it comes from uh, the picture of people stealing, running away, and being caught by grabbing of their heel. That's that's the 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 Hebrew picture that is is painted by the word Jacob. One translation also uh, has it as surplanter, supplanter, which is the ideal of stealing um, through nefarious means. Um there's a sense that the name Jacob describes Jacob as a deceiver because that's what he did his entire life, right? Um, I suspect Isaac was given that, uh, that idea to have his name be that. I mean, who wants to call their name when they're a baby? Hey, you're going to be a deceiver, so I'm going to call you deceiving. Well, so. wasn't, wasn't he holding Esau's heel when he was born? Yeah. And that's why they called him Jacob? Yeah, I. It's interesting you said that. Or, or I, the other way around. I can't remember. But, yeah. I, I was doing a little bit of deeper reading on on the the origin of the the word, and uh, there are some, not many, but some Hebrew linguists that that think the origin of the word came from that exact episode. I, I don't know if I believe that. Uh, you know, you'd have to you'd have to really look at the language to see if it was in place before they were born. But whatever. Rich, yeah. the word supplant, um, they call, they say that, that uh, Jacob has the meaning of supplant. To supplant means to put, to take something and put it in the place of something else. Right. Jacob put himself in the place of, right. of getting the father's blessings and birthright. Right. That we was we, really Esau's. We dealt with that all the time in uh, in grants. Um, we couldn't accept a grant and supplant something else. Meaning we couldn't take a grant and have that money be used in place of using the money somewhere else. It had right. to be in addition to what was, uh, and so that, that's the picture. He was taking for himself um, by, by removing things, the idea of stealing. Um, God changed Jacob's name to Israel, which means strived with God, but there's a lot of, discomfort maybe in scholars about what that really means we read in chapter 32 that jacob fought with the angel of the lord and and we know that the angel of the lord was at least a theophany probably a christophany meaning that this was the pre-incarnate jesus he was fighting with um and god says that he named jacob israel because he fought with god and prevailed do, do any of us believe that god lost the fight 
Oh. No. No. And, and, and that's not what we're being ta- told, but that's the picture you immediately get. You fought with God and you won. Well, no, he didn't win. He prevailed. What's another way that, uh, let me tell you what the word is. The Hebrew word is yechol. There, there's, a, there's a play on words between what he was called and what he, what he would be called. Because the, he, he prevailed is yechol, which has the underlying meaning of enduring or comprehending. So it wasn't that he Ooh. fought the battle with, with uh, the Christophany and won, but he endured to the end of it and finally got to the point, I can't fight God. He, he endured and comprehended, God's going to win. Why am I doing all this against him? He's going to win. So that, that's the idea of what, uh, what prevailing, what we have in the ESV prevailing should give us. Does, does that mean that Jacob beat, the, uh, beat God in the fight? No, of course not. But Jacob endured the physical and spiritual fight with God to arrive at a place where he properly submitted to God. And then we have this transformation of who Jacob was. He would now be called Israel because he finally got to the point where he understood his position before God. And he's an old guy by this time. He's been through a lot by this time. The significance, I think, of the name change is that it reflects the change in Jacob's life physically and spiritually. He's walking around as a gimp now, and he's he's now in tune to who God is and God's position in his life. Um, Jacob transitioned from being a self-serving deceiver or as I, as I called him when I was doing the Genesis series, a paisley wearing mama's boy, to uh, one who endured God, transitioned to a follower, a true follower of God. Late in life, he finally gets with the program. And so I, there's a lot there in the name change that we don't see in every apparent name change in Scripture. There, there's nothing so fancy in the... In the in the use of Paul and Saul, despite pastors wanting to preach that because it preaches good. In this case, there actually is a transition. In Paul, there's only a transition of language, not of name. Questions or comments on that? Okay, then uh, in the next one, let's prepare to get your socks blown off. I don't wear I don't have any socks on so it'll be easy for me. Read Genesis 37 1 through 11. What was the purpose of Joseph's dreams? Genesis 37 1 to 11. Jacob lived in the land of his father's sojourning in the land of Canaan. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was pasturing the flock with his brothers. He was a boy with the sons of Bilhah and Zilpah, his father's wives. And Joseph uh, brought a bad report to them, to, of them to their father. Now Israel loved Joseph more than, the other, than any of his other sons because he was the son of his old age. And he made him a robe of many colors, a technicolor dream coat. But when his brothers saw that their father loved him more than the other than all his brothers, they hated him and could not speak peacefully to him. Now Joseph had a dream when he when he told it to his brothers, they hated him even more. And he said to them, "Hear this dream that I have dreamed." I always thought that would have been dreamt, but behold, we were binding sheaves in the, in the field, and behold, my sheaf arose and stood upright. And behold, your sheaves gathered around it and bowed down to my sheaf. Yeah, they're going to like that a lot. His brother said to him, Are you indeed to reign over us? Or are you indeed to rule over us? So they hated him even more for his dreams and for his words. Then he dreamed another dream and told it to his brothers, Behold, I've dreamed another dream. Behold, the sun, the moon, and the eleven stars are bowing down to me. But when he told his father, it to his father and to his brothers. His father rebuked him and said, What is this dream that you have dreamed? Shall I and your mother and your brothers indeed come to bow ourselves to the ground before you? And his brothers were jealous 
of him, but the father kept the sayings in his mind. So what's the purpose of the dreams? Could it be could they be the straw that broke the camel's back and pushed his brothers over the edge? Yeah, I think that's a large part of it. Which led him to put Joseph in Egypt? Yeah, I think that's a large part of it. Yeah. And they're prophetic. They are. Yeah, when we when we go on to Genesis uh, chapter 50 verse uh, 15 when Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, this is long after now. He's he's prime minister in Egypt, um, and uh, Jacob has now died. It may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for all the evil that we did to him. So they send a message to Joseph saying, Your father gave this command before he died. So uh, say to Joseph, Please forgive the transgression of your brothers in their sin, because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgression of the servants and of God your father and of the, of the servants of the God of your father. Joseph wept and they spoke when they spoke to him. His brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for I am in the place for am I in the place of God? As for you, you meant it against me, but God meant it for you meant you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. So do not fear, I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. I've often talked about this issue. Why would God give Joseph a or I shouldn't say talk, thought about this issue. Why would God give Joseph these dreams and have Joseph tell his brothers? It wasn't until recently in reading this passage that going over it again and again that it finally hit me. This is all part of God's plan. Clearly I kn I've known that. But this is how God orchestrates us to do things without making us do things. So here, the, the, the primary thing we need to see here, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. Moses is recording here Joseph's statement, giving, giving culpability for what happened to both the brothers and to God. It's clear that Joseph understood who was involved in this. The brothers decided to sell Joseph. That's clear from the text, right? He made them mad. And they said, rather than kill him, they sold him into the Ishmaelites, into a caravan, into uh, Egypt. God did not make them do that. God didn't, you know, they're not little uh, uh, automatons that are doing what God tells them to do. But he did create the environment for them to do what they did, knowing that they would do it. They are guilty of the sin. How, how can God convict them of this sin if he made them do it? It doesn't make sense, right? It's not, it's not kosher. But God created the environment for them to sin in and knew that they would react that way in sin. We dealt with this issue when I ran electronic surveillance. We dealt with this issue a lot. We had a neat system for bait cards. We could take just about any car and we could outfit it with uh, remote control, stop, uh, kill the engine. We even set up one that would play bad boys for them. And we would, we would get with the insurance companies and find out what cars are most popular to be stolen currently. And then we'd set it up and it would get left in, a, in an area where the propensity for it to be in, being stolen was rather high. And uh, as soon as somebody tampered with it, we'd get the alert. And uh, once a deputy would get behind it, we would then shut the car off and play bad boys and lock the windows and roll up the, lock the doors, roll up the windows, and there they were trapped. So the very first time this went to court, the... Uh, the defense argued this is entrapment and the prosecutor said did they 
Did, did the cops hold a gun to their head? Did, did they make them do that? No. Okay, it's not entrapment. Because entrapment is you've got to make them do something they're not ordinarily predisposed to do. We just set up the environment to make it possible for them to do it. That's what we're talking about here. God set up the environment, gave Joseph the dream, told Joseph, hey, tell your brothers, this will be fun. Almost like he's sitting back watching and enjoying it. And, and they, they, they get mad at him. They're going to kill him. They decide not to kill him, but sell him. This is exactly like the Garden of Eden. Created in perfection. God walking in the garden with Adam and Eve. He didn't make them sin. He created the environment that it made it, made it possible knowing they would. This is how Adam can be charged with sin. Because God didn't make him sin. Remember, God's not the author of sin. But he created the environment knowing how they would respond. And they responded that way. Adam and Eve did. God created the environment for Joseph to tell his brothers they would sell him into slavery because he had created that environment. Why do you suppose the Ishmaelites were there at that time? Because God directed all that. Yeah, God did all that. And, and he orchestrates all that, but he doesn't make us do the sin. We choose to do the sin. And so he, he creates that environment. They do exactly what he knows they're going to do. And Joseph ends up in, in Egypt, ultimately becoming the... Uh, um, prime minister and saving the region from seven years of famine to me this is a fascinating account of that antinomy that that tension we always have about my free will and god's sovereignty and i say it in the personal like i did because that's a tension for me but we can never say we can never use the flip wilson excuse the devil made me do it or God made me do it. Our sin is all our own. God just created the environment to make it possible, and we we didn't disappoint him. We sinned right away. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yes, yeah, so it's a good example. I like it. Now the question is, we need to we need to think about the things in our life that God is using to to nudge us to push us, to put us in the perfect situation where we'll do what he wants us to do. Both positive and negative, right? He doesn't ever make us sin, but he puts us in circumstances where we do. Sometimes so we get caught, so we get the help we need. Thinking of drug dealers or drug addicts. Sometimes God gives them enough rope so they hang themselves so then they are forced into getting clean. Or the alcoholic that gets cirrhosis of the liver. They're forced to get in clean. But other times he, he uses the same techniques in a positive fashion to get us somewhere. And it's hard to categorize which way it's going. But God is always orchestrating, but he's never forcing. But he always knows what you're going to do. This is the perfect picture of that tension between your free will and God's sovereignty. And I still don't understand it. Question or comment on that one? Okay, let's move on. After reading the narrative concerning Joseph and his rise to power in Egypt, what principle or principles do you see from the general text? From, from the long narrative, you know, the, the last section of the book of Genesis... As, uh, as Joseph gets sold into slavery, goes through that whole mess with Potiphar's wife and, and prison, and ra rises to uh, prominence and power in, in the, uh, in the e Egyptian government, second in power. What's the principle through all of that narrative? God uses a lot of, t of text space to tell us that story. And what are the principle or principles from that that story? 
Romans 8, 28. You mean this one? And we know that uh, for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called according to his purpose. And for those whom he foreknew, he predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. You mean that verse? Verse this? Well, thinking, yeah, I was thinking specifically of the one that uh, God used, that there is good from everything that God plans. We don't necessarily see this good or comfort for us, but it's always good for his plan. Yeah. That God works, uh, uh, know that those who love God, uh, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose, not necessarily our good, yeah, but for that, good, yeah. But just thinking of that. Yeah, I, I think ultimately God works everything out for his glory. Um, and, and sometimes that means we go through tough patches. Could God have, have written this scene such that Joseph um, goes from, uh, from Canaan to uh, Egypt and becomes uh, um, prime minister without having to be spend time in a pit, be sold to the Ishmaelites, um, go to prison, and uh, get attacked by uh, Potiphar's wife and all that. Could God have done it without all that? Yeah, sure he could have. But we wouldn't have this lesson if he didn't. Exactly. Exactly. But Joe... But Joseph might not have had the character that was necessary because in, in all of what Joseph suffered, I think he got knocked down a peg or two until he was truly submissive to God as well. Yeah, I, I wish Moses had given us more detail about Joseph's attitude and demeanor before. When he was wearing his Technicolor dream coat, was he flaunting that to his brothers? You know, if you, if you look at the preachers that have preached these passages, you can see it either way. And, and I don't know that the scripture tells us. I don't know that we have a picture of what his demeanor was like. Uh, the only picture we see of, of Joseph's demeanor was he was always trusting God no matter what. Yeah, and he was, he was also obedient, trusting right. God and obedient. Right, exactly right. He was obedient. He, he trusted God and, and knew that ultimately this would be fine, even if it meant his own demise, ultimately God would be glorified through it. And I think that's the principle we really need to see in this. In everything that we go through, ultimately God is, is glorified. You know, I, I think of, I, I, this is one of my favorite verses in, uh, in Ephesians 3.20. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than we ask or think according to the power at work within us. Let me give you a modern, really recent illustration about this. After Hurricane Ian, Encompass World Partners and uh, specifically Barb Wooler orchestrated um, disaster relief in uh, in florida they brought some teams down to help uh do some work and uh encompass world partners committed five thousand to the florida district um for the pur purchase of a disaster relief trailer and equipment to be kept in florida maintained by florida ready to be deployed by the florida churches when disaster would strike and we've been working on putting all that together, do, all, doing all the logistics and, and getting the equipment order and all that kind of stuff. And one of the things that became a problem for us was the trailer that was necessary. Um, Encompass originally had a trailer specified that was going to be purchased. That purchase fell through and the price of enclosed small trailers went through the roof. And there wasn't enough money between Encompass or the district to do it. And so last week at Ministerium, we did, we talked about it and, and we concluded we still wanted to do it, but we were going to have to trust God for a trailer because we just didn't have the funds to get a trailer. That was on Tuesday of last week. On Thursday of last week, the Port Ritchie Church, uh, Gulfview Grace Church, 
received a call from a seasonal resident and a member of the church who had an almost brand new enclosed trailer exactly the size that we were looking for with shelves and uh, and uh, um, equipment storage already in, in it that he wanted to donate and he was looking for somebody to donate it to. It was exactly what we needed. And I can tell you this for a fact. On Tuesday when we were praying about it, none of us anticipated God was going to drop a trailer on us. By Thursday, he had dropped a trailer on us. God does way more than we can ever think. More than we can ever plan. And so when we go through things, we don't know what the end result is going to be. We don't know what it's going to be like. We don't know what God's going to do through it. We just know that it's part of what he's doing. And what I've been learning is God does way more than I can ever dream. I'm, I, I, don't, I dream a lot probably, but I don't remember my dreams, so I don't know. But I can't envision even God blessing more than he already does. But he's going to. Questions, comments on that one? That's pretty cool. Did yeah. the porch church announce that they needed a trailer? No. See, that's even more cool. No, there was absolutely he. The guy that donated had absolutely no clue what was going on, and he started to cry when uh, Mark, the associate pastor up there, who took the call from him, who is in charge of this project for the district, said, "Here's what's going on. Here's what we prayed at ministerium two days ago." And if I recall what Mark told me, it was about that time when the guy was convicted to, to donate to the church. Well, okay, that's pretty cool. Okay, now let's get on to a, a question that Mary sent in. Why would the Israelites submit to slavery by Egypt when their numbers were great enough to cause Pharaoh to fear? Is that a pretty good summation of what you said? Yep. So why would they do that? Let's look at the text. Exodus 1, 1 through 7. These are the names of the sons of Israel who came to Egypt with Jacob, each with his own household. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, and Judah. Issachar, Zebulun, and Benjamin. Dan, and Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. All the descendants of Jacob were 70 persons. Joseph was already in Egypt. And then Joseph died and all his brothers and all that in all that generation. But the people of Israel were fruitful and increased greatly. They multiplied and grew exceedingly strong so that the land was filled with them. So there's a picture of over the next 400 years Israel grows to be a large people. They have lots of kids, and their kids have lots of kids, and their kids' kids have lots, lots of kids. Exponentially grows, right? So let's carry on in the, in the uh, narrative. Now there arose a new king over Egypt who did not know Joseph. That's an important word, remember that. And he said to his people, Behold, the people of Israel are too many and too mighty for us. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply, and if war breaks out, they join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Oops. And escape from the land. Okay, there. So, what clues are we given in that text? The Egyptians were afraid of the Israelites. They were afraid of their power. Which Egyptians? <laughs> because the ones before weren't. The ones that, that came after the Pharaoh that and the Pharaohs that thought kindly and well of Joseph were gone, and nobody remembered him anymore. Correct. Historians believe that this event corresponds to the ascension of Pharaoh Hamos I, who was the first king of the 18th, 18th uh, Egyptian dynasty. The reason 
a king who did not know Joseph rose up is because it was a new family line to take power in Egypt. Egypt as a as a kingdom, basically it was son, grandson, and so forth that kept power unless somebody was able to execute a coup. In this case, uh, Amos the first, while he was related to the, the, to the kings of the 17th dynasty, he was not in the direct line of becoming king. And he, he grew up in Upper Egypt, which, by the way, means Southern Egypt. It's backwards. Lower Egypt is, is toward the Mediterranean. Upper Egypt is down south. He grew up way south in Egypt, what is today Ethiopia, and uh, maybe even as far south as uh, um, whatever comes next. Anyway, it doesn't matter. And, and so he's well removed. But he takes, he, he executes a military coup, and he, he kills everybody left from the 17th dynasty, creating a new dynasty following his family name, now and his descendants. And since he primarily ruled after that in southern Egypt, Goshen is in, uh, in northern Egypt. And they didn't know each other. Lynn and I watched a, a special a few weeks ago from uh, Josh Gates' Expedition Unknown, <coughs> where he went and and actually went to some of the ruins of the 17th and 18th dynasties, and there was a marked difference in the people between the 17th and 18th dynasties. And so what we have is we have a completely new new dynasty of of rulers that had no contact with with Israel with the Hebrews really don't call them Israel yet uh, with the Hebrews and when they started looking at their military um, bases around them the the militaries around them they saw this large group of people who were not military but they were large sort of unified people there were 12 tribes loosely confederated into the Hebrews. And they reasoned, we've got to deal with them because they are so large. They have, you know, they, babies are having babies, having babies, having babies. And they became uh, exponential. There, there, there are some estimates that the, the, the amount of Hebrews leaving Egypt in the Exodus was between 1.6 and 6 million Jews. That's a large group of people for that day, and much larger than the territory of people that the 18th dynasty controlled. So all of that fits perfectly with, with, with the narrative. And so they felt like they had to, to subjugate them. The Hebrews were not military, they are not powerful, they they were they were good workers. They had good farms. They had good herds, but they had herds primarily of sheep and goats, which was not something uh, you, we see that at the end of Genesis that sheep 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 was not something that the uh, the uh, Egyptians liked. But here was this big group of people that had a lot of sheep, and so they felt like they had to take them before they got military power. And so we have this subjugation of, Israel, of, uh, of the Hebrews of Israel. And, and we have what becomes a significant issue for, uh, for the Hebrews. Again, playing right into God's plan. Does that, does that answer the question, Mary? It answers the why, but not necessarily the how. If there's that many people, I still don't understand why they allowed it to happen. Because they're not military. They had no weapons. Other than the weapons they used to fight off animals and stuff, there was nothing organized about the Hebrews that would make them able to defend themselves. I that see. was just not something in their playbook. Which is another reason that God orchestrated it so it took 40 years to go through the wilderness. Because they had to teach them 
how to be a military, how to be a defensive people. Actually, how to be an offensive people. I never thought of that. Yeah, there, there, a lot had to happen. If Israel had had cross, if if the twelve spies had looked into into the promised land and said, "Yeah, we can do it," it would have been entirely God's work, without them doing anything, and the the picture of them as an organized, fearful military would not have been there. So. God's plan was for them to spend 40 years in the wilderness, so there was time to treat to teach the kids born in the wilderness or the people under 18 that left Egypt how to be good military uh, uh, military families and people. That was not something in the Hebrew playbook. That, that was not anything that they ever thought of. They they were just they were subsistence people that that lived pretty good. Because they had big families, big farms, lots of animals. Okie doke. Okay. Let's, we got one more question tonight. Because this one's kind of fun for me. Where was Midian when, when Moses left Egypt, when he fled Egypt when he was 40 years old? He went to Midian. And he encountered the burning bush. Where was the burning bush? Northern Saudi Arabia? What, what what does the text tell us? The burning bush was at what? No, I was answering where was Midian. <laughs> I guess I didn't put it in. Um, Exodus 3, 2. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of a, uh, out of the midst of the bush. And he looked and behold, the bush was not burning and it was consumed. Well, I didn't put all the, the full uh, verse in there. Um, that happened at Mount Horeb. What's another name for Mount Horeb? Mount Sinai. Mount Sinai, right. So, here, here is Moses, prince of Egypt, fleeing the pharaoh of Egypt. Does it make sense for him to stay in Egypt? No. He needs to get out of Egypt, right? Yeah. So, here is... I'll, I'll make this full screen so it's a little easier for you to see. Here's a picture... Of uh, you see Egypt, and you see the Sinai Peninsula, and then you see uh, um, they're shaded in purple, gray, whatever it is. Midian. Midian is to the east of the Gulf of Aqaba in the Red Sea. The Sinai Peninsula, that that map that you see that on this particular one, and I use this one on purpose, shows where um, where the traditional Mount Sinai is in the middle of the Sinai Peninsula which by the way is why it's called the Sinai Peninsula because in the uh, 4th century one of the uh, emperor's mother wanted a place to have a shrine and so she found this mountain in the Sinai Peninsula and said it was Mount Sinai and St. Catherine's was built there and it was enshrined as being Mount Sinai. It doesn't meet any of the criteria to be Mount Sinai. And Moses, if Mount Sinai and Mount Horeb are the same, and we have several references in Scripture to them being the same, if Mount Horeb, where, he, where, where Moses saw the burning bush, is in Egypt, he didn't get too far. And so Midian, the, Midian is always described as being east of the uh, Gulf of Aqaba, east of the, 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 uh, the Red Sea. There are some modern scholars that say, yeah, but the Midianites also crossed over the, the Gulf and they, they settled in some places in, uh, in southern uh, Sinai Peninsula. Those statements are not backed up by any archaeological or scientific facts. So here's a, here's a little bit better way to, uh, to see the, the, the map. I'll make it again full screen for you. So when Moses left... He's probably on in uh, in Upper Egypt is probably where where Pharaoh's uh, um, ruling pa uh, palace was in southern Egypt. So Moses flees 
either across the Gulf of Suez and across the Gulf of Aqaba, or he flees north around the Gulf of Suez and through the Sinai into Midian. So he's, he's, he's running a long way to get away from, uh, from Egypt because Egypt never has ever possessed the territory east of the Gulf of Aqaba. It's never been possessed by, by Egypt. It's always been somebody else. And at this time, it was called Midian. You know, like we see in, in, this, in this map, that gives you the extent of what the, what the Midianites occupied. That's where he met his father-in-law, Jethro. And that's where he, where he uh, meets the Lord on the, uh, at the burning bush. And that's where he goes back to in, uh, in, in the Exodus, 40 years later from the burning bush, back to Mount Sinai, where he receives the law. And I would argue that Jabal al-Laz in Saudi Arabia is the right place, at least the right region, if it's not the right place. Mount Sinai with Mount Count, with uh, um, Saint Catherine's on the top is not Mount Sinai. It meets none, none, zero of the biblical description criteria. Jabal el laws meets them all, and with that, I'm done. Have they done any archaeological digging around Jabal el laws However, you say that to find anything. No. Well, I shouldn't say no. Some has been done. But uh, Saudi Arabia has, has fenced. It, it's in the middle of desert. There's no habitable area around it. But it is fenced off and guarded. And several Christian uh, archaeolog archaeologists have tried to get in. Some have scaled the fence and, and gotten in and taken some pictures. Others have taken pictures from the outside. Um... It is. Uh, it looks. It looks exactly like what's being described. There are even twelve pillars, stone pillars, still around it, and I believe Saudi Arabia believes it's the uh, the Exodus um, Mount Sinai, and they don't want the Jews or the Church to to get any more evidence of that, and so they're they are heavily guarding it and protecting it. So until Saudi Arabia is no longer run by the Wahhabi sect of Islam, we will never get into that. I'll have to send a drone or a spy thing. Yeah, you can, that doesn't help you as much as getting in there and doing some archaeological sifting and so forth. But look up, uh, well, you, you were, you've seen him. Uh, um, well, I can't think of his name all of a sudden. Um, um. The, Cornuke, Cornuke. Yeah, Bob Cornuke. You, you've Bob you've Cornuke. sat through some lectures by Robert Cornuke when he when he talks about this when we were at the Worldview Weekend, and uh, just just do a search for for Base Institute. I think it's Base Institute. Uh, that's his uh, his uh, group, and uh, look at his evidence why Jabal al Laws is uh, the Mount Sinai. I think you'll be you'll be like me convinced. I think was already convinced. That's but, why I said northern Saudi Arabia. Well, it's actually southern, but thanks for playing. <laughs> okay, any other questions or comments? I've gone over again. Sorry. Thank you for watching or listening to this teaching on demand from Friendship Grace Brethren Church. Please consider sending us an email at info at friendshipgracebrethren.com to let us know how this teaching may have helped you. Please also consider joining us in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church, located at 10251 Metro Parkway, Suite 116, Fort Myers, Florida, just south of the intersection of Metro and Colonial Boulevard. Sunday school begins at 9 and worship service at 10 a.m. We look forward to seeing you in person at Friendship Grace Brethren Church.